one of the first types of cancers shown to be eradicated by radiation uh, and that is mainly attributed to brachytherapy and brachytherapy in carcinoma cervix has withstood a series of technological and biological innovations over almost last 100 years and still continues to remain an integral part of curative therapy. So if I have to say it the other way, you cannot treat carcinoma cervix or locally advanced carcinoma cervix without brachytherapy. Okay. So what favors the use of brachytherapy in cervical cancer and why is it that a squamous cell of the cervix is better treated or has better outcomes as compared to squamous cell carcinomas of other sites, especially the aerodigestive tract? So the reason is that the whole of the cervical uterine complex, that is the uterus, cervix, vaginal walls, they are densely vascularized structures and the tolerance to radiation is very, very high. And if you remember the, um, your NTCP and TCP curve, the widen you can displace it, the better therapeutic ratio you can achieve. And this is what is applicable in cervical cancer also. So because the radiation tolerance of these organs is very high, we are able to deliver high doses. And at the same time, you do have adjoining critical organs of bladder and rectum, which you can displace with a good packing. And you can satisfactorily achieve the tolerance doses to these organs. And with proper arrangement of the radioactive sources, the use of the imaging and newer techniques now in the present era, cervical cancer continues to be highly curable and you can actually deliver very, very high therapeutic doses um, to this disease. Now, if you look at historically, historically, there were three methods that were developed between the 1910 and 1930 and for brachytherapy. And these were Stockholm, Paris and Manchester system. So just start taking you through all these systems. The classical Stockholm system was one of the first systems of brachytherapy in intracavitary uh, in cervical cancer. And here a fractionated course of radiation was delivered over a period of one month where three insertions were given of 22 hours each and they were repeated every one to three weeks. Now this Stockholm applicator was basically a flat box which had a preloaded radium source for vaginal placement. And if you can see in A and B, these were the kind of boxes which had preloaded radium uh, for application. Then it also had intrauterine tubes uh, with radium of variable length. And this was a loose system. So the boxes and the tandem were not fixed to each other. There was unequal loading. The loading of radium was to the tune of 30 to 90 milligrams of radium in the um, tandem and 60 to 80 milligram in the vagina. And the total prescribed dose was in milligram uh, radium or onion per hour. And it was 6,500 to 7,100 milligram um, of radium. So simultaneously came the Paris system of intra-cavity uh, brachytherapy. And this was devised by Claudine Rigaud and Anthony in 1910. Now, again, they used radium to 26 sources. Now, this had a blinded ended rubber tandem, which was again placed in the uterus. And they had three, it had three rhodium sources. And the ratio was one is to one is 2.5. So the top was heavy and the bottom became light. And the two colpostats joined to contain 13.33 milligram of radium sources each. So what we saw here was that almost equal amounts of radium was used in the uterus and vagina. This was given as a single application over five days and the dose was 7,200 to 8,000 milligram hours at a dose rate of 45 ronjan per hour. Again, this was a loose system of brachytherapy. Now, what happened was that during this time, the Manchester system came into place and this was developed by Todd and Meredith in the 1930. And this was further pioneered by Patterson and Parker. Now, what they realized is that all these were loop systems and they were using radium and there was no common platform where dose comparisons could be done. So there was a unique dosage system which was required, uh, necessary for these treatments. And they abandoned the previous dosage of milligram hours in favors of Ronjin units. They also defined a point of prescription um, so as to have everybody on the common platform uh, and to have a point where everybody to pres uh, could prescribe the dose. And these points were point A and point B. They also stressed the importance of a constant dose rate and introduced a reproducible technique which could aim at better tumor control with less radiation morbidity. And Manchester system till date continues to be the backbone of radiotherapy um, planning uh, till date. 
So coming to the most important points that were devised during that time, which still hold true and are used till today, that was point A. So basically what happened is that they needed a point which could be a dose limiting point. And they chose this point to be the paracervical triangle where the initial radio necrosis occurs. So this area corresponds to the area of the medial edge of the broad ligament where the uterine vessels cross over the ureter. And this forms a triangle and that point is the point A. Now, Manchester system, since that time, they were just using x-rays. So Manchester system defined this point as a fixed point, which was two centimeter lateral to the center of the uterine canal above from the mucosa of the fornix. So this was from the mucosa of the fornix. Now, subsequently, this definition was revised to uh, the starting point being the external os or the lowermost source of the uh, flange or the lowermost source or the uh, flange. Now, over a period of time, this point A has also been revised. And what we currently use is the ABS recommendation of point A. And this was because there was failure of vaginal furnaces to show up on radiographs and the rotation of the applicator could occur, which could not you know, give a proper point A. Um, uh, we could not define point A properly. So what ABS recommended for point A was, and this is what we use, that you connect a line through the center of the ovoids and from a point on the tandem where this line bisects, you extend superiorly two centimeters plus add this radius and define point A on each side as uh, uh, laterally perpendicular to this point on the tandem. Now, what I want to highlight for the residents is that there is a very a uh, common mistake that most of you make uh, in definition of point A. Now, point A is a point which is a point based on applicator and it is a point in reference to the central tandem. So if the tandem is tilted, your point A is going to be tilted. So this is always in reference to the tandem. Okay. Now, subsequently, a point B was also defined and this was a second point and this was basically to know the dose rate fall off in relation to point A, and this determined the index of the volume of the tissue that was treated. Now, this was defined as five centimeters from the patient's midline at the same level as point A. Now, what I would want you to highlight is, whereas point A moves with the applicator and it is in reference to the tandem, point B is a fixed point which refers to the obturated lymph nodes, and it is always in reference to patient's midline, but it is always taken at the same level as point A. And this quantifies, like I said, dose to the, deliver to the obturated lymph nodes, and the dose to point B is usually about 15 to 20% of dose to point A. Why this is important is because till date, these basic concepts hold true, and this is very important for you to understand, uh, you know, about the basis of brachytherapy in cervical cancer. Also, what the system gave was they gave various intrauterine tubes or various lengths, and they gave ovoids, and there was a loading pattern device. Now, each tube had an active length of 1.5 centimeter and a total length of 2 centimeter. And each unit here was equivalent to 2.5 milligrams of radium, which was filtered by 1 millimeter of platinum. Now, this intrauterine tube and these ovoid, which was spherical and were made of rubber, were fixed together by a washer or a spacer. So if the vaginal space was adequate, a spacer was used. And if it was a narrow vagina, then a washer was used. And the tandem was always um, placed perpendicular to the ovoids. So the largest possible ovoids were used. Why? Because that led to lesser dose to the mucosa. The longest possible tandem had to be used, which did not have to be more than six centimeters. And that had to be because of the anisotropic distribution and contribution to have a better lateral throw off of the dose. The dose to point A had to be 8,000 ronjin, and the dose rate was 57.5 ronjin per hour to point A. So no matter what combination of the ovoid and the tandem you use, there, it was a fixed dose rate at point A. And also the loading had to be such that not more than one third dose of point A had to be delivered from the vaginal radium. So the contribution from the ovoids had to be one third of point A, not more than that. 
with such an application, the dose to the uterine wall was close to 30,000 ronjin. And like I said before, that the uterus has a very high tolerance. And if you are prescribing to a point beyond the, the uterus and this area, the dose that is being received, received is actually two to two and a half times. And the dose to the cervix was to the tune or is to the tune of 20 to 20,000 ronjin if you convert it into uh, gray uh, in the present day and the vaginal mucosa had to be 10,000 ronjin. The dose to the rectovaginal septum had to be not more than 6750 six, ronjin, which in current day also we practice that we keep the constraints to 65 fray. And the dose limitations were bladder had to be less than 80 and rectum less than 75. Now, during this time, they were all loose systems and they used radium. And subsequently, in, from 1950 to about 1980, there was a lot of change that happened. There was a lot of modernization in radiation uh, techniques and applicators. And what happened is that there was a requirement of fixed rigid applicators or semi-rigid applicators which came into place. But they continued to mimic the classical applicator geometries. And also, we had to do away with the radium because of its problems. And subsequently, there were new radionuclides which were introduced for brachytherapy, which were the cobalt-60, the cesium-137 for medium dose rate, and the iridium-192 for high dose rate. Also, this, saw, this era saw a very rapid change in the dose rates that were used. We started from LDR, and in the 80s, we came to MDR and HDR did start from the 60s. And today what we continue is with HDR applications. And also we needed adaptation of these applications to suit various clinical situations. So these applicators now came with different lengths, angles and curvatures of the intrauterine catheter. There were different shapes and sizes of ovoids or rings. Shieldings were incorporated to spare these tissues and the geometry was either kept fixed or semi-fixed. Also, with the HDR uh, coming into play, there was reduction in the tandem of uh, uh, diameter. Why? Because the HDR source is a, is a very miniaturized source. And this facilitated easy insertion. And obviously, this uh, um, led to less patient discomfort. Now, during this time, again, the Fletcher preloaded applicators also after the Manchester system were devised and they were also devised in early 1950s. Now, they, this Fletcher system developed a system that combined a rigid metallic intrauterine tandem. So this was one of the first uh, rigid applicators, a semi-rigid applicator with cylindrical uh, ovoids. Now, this were, these ovoids were positioned against the cervix and they were perpendicular to the axis of the vagina. Now, how this was different from the Manchester system was in the Manchester system, the tandem was placed perpendicular to the ovoids, whereas in the Fletcher system, this was placed perpendicular to the axis of the vagina. So if we use the Manchester system of brachytherapy or applicators, they do lead to higher doses to the bladder and rectum. And the Fletcher suit, because of this angulation, um, leads to lesser need for need for lesser packing, which is a hallmark of these applicators. Now, these had to be subsequently modified because we moved on from preloaded to afterloading systems. And it was modified by suit and it hence started to be known as Fletcher suit applicator. And then, uh, and this was done basically to accommodate the cesium 137. And further modification by Delcos for manual and remote afterloading led to this applicator being named as the Fletcher suit Delcos applicator, which we um, call it today. They also incorporated the shielding that was tungsten was integrated into the anterior and posterior part of the ovoids. This was designed to reduce the dose to the bladder trigone and the anterior rectal wall without decreasing irradiation to the uterosacral and broad ligaments. However, there was a bit of a concern of shielding the dose also. And in the present day applicators where we have now moved on from CT uh, to CTMR compatible applicators, we are done away with these uh, shields, shieldings. Now, similarly, the Manchester applicator was also modified and uh, you can see this modification, but the basic concept remained the same. The initial angulation that was available was 40 degree, but in today's uh, uh, um, era, we do have components, various intrauterine angles that are there. But like I said, we do stick to the basic concept and the basic uh, original uh, geometry that has been recommended. 
Then based on Stockholm system, we have the ring applicator. And uh, I'm sure uh, uh, many of you must be using this applicator. Now, the advantage of this is that it, it facilitates easier placement and it's a fixed reproducible geometry. However, because the sources are not, uh, you know, are at a short distance from the surface of the ring, the dose to the vaginal mucosa or is higher as compared to the ovoid based applicators. And sometimes they may not be suitable for patients with a narrow vagina. Now they do say that patients who have, uh, uh, you know, um, effaced furnaces, it is easy application, but in my personal experience, I feel it's patients who have, a, 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 you know, <coughs> intact cervix or in patients where the cervix is not flush, they are the patients where you can easily place these applicators. So what happened was that we were dealing during this time with point A with change in applicators and we realized that people were differently reporting point A and there were a lot of problems with reporting at point A. And at that particular time, 19, uh, in 1985, the ICRU came up with a report where they recommended those, uh, they, they did not recommend doses to be reported to point A. Instead, they gave the concept of a reference volume and they recommended reporting of this absorbed dose at a number of reference points related to tissue and the pelvis. And this was basically done to achieve uniformity for comparison worldwide. Okay. So they also gave us the important bladder and rectal points, which we again use till date. And this has been very widely adopted into clinical practice. Now, uh, how do you report the bladder point? On a frontal radiograph, the bladder point is marked at the center of the balloon. And the rectal point is identified on the frontal radiograph at the midpoint of the ovoid sources. So where the ovoids bisect the tandem and take a line through that, mark 0.5 centimeters posterior to the posterior vaginal wall in that plane, and that is a rectal reference point. And we use this point till to date, and this is also now known as the rectal vaginal reference point. Now, uh, they also gave some points related to bony structures and lymph node topography, and they gave pelvic reference points, and they gave points in the lymphatic uh, trapezoid. And these points indicated the dose to the lateral margins of the small pelvis and to different nodal regions, namely the external iliac, the common iliac, and the lower parietic regions. Now, while all this was happening, uh, we did have uh, advancements in imaging and we were moving on from 2D to 3D imaging using CT and MRIs and we changed um, two conformal radiotherapy techniques for our external radiotherapy but we continued at that point in time to prescribe to point A and what happens was we uh, happened was that we did realize that point A basically um, was just an empiric point and it no way was reflecting the dose to the tumor and also this point is located where there are very high dose gradients and to the tune of those changes of 10% per every millimeter. So this point may not be a very valid point to uh, reflect the dose to the tumor. Also, there is absence of visual information. So you are prescribing to an arbitrary point and that does not have any correlation to the tumor per se. And also the maximum doses received by OARs are not accurately known uh, because uh, these geometrically defined points are again based on 2D and they are insufficient representation of these two do doses. Now, this picture that I'm showing you on the right basically just depicts the inadequacy of point A. Now, suppose you have a small tumor. This tumor may be covered by point A, but in case you have a large tumor, what you can see here shaded in blue is that you do have the potential of missing the tumor. And on the other side, you could have a very small tumor, which actually does not require so much of volume to be irradiated. So something needed to be done about it. And about 15 years ago in 2005, there were these recommendations that came uh, from the Jack Astro group. And these are the four papers that I would very strongly recommend for every resident to go through thoroughly. So these Jack Astro recommendations gave us the concepts of 3D image based planning with emphasis, uh, and they used MRI for GTV and CTV delineation. They gave us the terminologies, they gave us uh, references to target volume delineation, to AR contouring and treatment planning. And hence, thereafter, we started to move from point-based planning to image-guided adaptive planning. Now, they defined different target volumes according to the cancer cell density. 
And these volumes were the low risk, the intermediate risk and the high risk volume. The low risk volume is the one that is taken care by the external radiation. And it is the high risk volume and the intermediate risk volume that we deal with brachytherapy. And high risk volume is the volume that deals with the macroscopic tumor load. Now, what were these recommendations? In a nutshell, the recommendation of high-risk CTB is the CTB that you irradiate is at the time of brachytherapy. Now, this constitutes the gross tumor volume at brachytherapy. What is the residual disease post-external radiation is the gross tumor volume at brachytherapy. Plus, it also includes the whole cervix, irrespective of the fact whether there is residual disease in the rest of the cervix, it includes the whole cervix. And it also includes any presumed cervical uh, tumor extension, which could be some extension to the parametria or an extension into the vagina. Now, this presumed tumor extension can be um, either uh, assessed by a clinical assessment or using an MRI by defining the residual gray zones on MR. Now, you do not give any safety margins. The dose delivered to this HRCTB has to be high enough to sterilize the macroscopic tumor. And the intent to deliver is 85 to 90 gray. And this is comparable to point A. So this is a counterpart of point A when we use image-guided brachytherapy. So the dose prescription now is to HRCTB. Now coming to the intermediate risk CTV. Now this integrates the GTV at diagnosis and it always includes the HRCTV. This is basically a safety margin which is chosen according to the tumor size and location, potential spread and regression, ensuring a minimum safety margin of one centimeter. So even if you have a stable disease, or a suboptimal response, the minimal safety margin that you take is one centimeter laterally and 0.5 anteriorly and posteriorly for the bladder and rectum. But you ensure that the, uh, the information or it always includes the GTV at diagnosis. And this concept basically comes from the Paris concept and the ICRU 38, uh, which is uh, in uh, the, uh, basically in alignment with the 60 degree reference isotopes that they have referred to or recommended. Now, this is uh, basically to sterilize the macroscopic tumor. And the intent here is to ensure that 60 gray is delivered to this IRCTV. And like I said, this dose compares to the 60 degree reference IC, uh, isotopes of the ICRU 38. Now, they also recommend uh, defining volumetric uh, uh, doses and contouring the organs. So instead of the point doses, we now report the minimum dose to the most irradiated area. So what you see in this color wash is the red shows you the 0.1 cc, the orange 1 cc, and the green 2 cc for the bladder, rectum, and sigmoid. And these you, rep, uh, you report these doses, but the most common uh, reported parameter is the D2CC. And it is assumed that these volumes are uh, contiguous. And it is often uh, misunderstood as the maximum dose to a 2CC tissue, whereas this is the minimum dose that is, this area receives. Now, when using image-guided brachytherapy, the dose prescription is always related to the target. And the prescription dose is planned to cover this target as completely as possible. And how we start this, how do we prescribe? We always start from the standard dose prescription. And what is the standard dose prescription? The standard dose prescription is that you usually start from point A. So you start your prescription point from point A. And at the same time, you keep assessing your HRCTV coverage and you carefully adapt the loading pattern and the dwell times to ensure adequate coverage of the HRCTV, ensuring that it receives the 85 to 90 gray of dose. And you then calculate the total EQD2 dose. The current standards for reporting EQD2 doses is in terms of two gray equivalent fractions, because we know that we have various dose fractionations that are being used for HDR. At the same time, people are using PDR as well. So you have to be on some common uh, platform to report these doses. So we use the two gray equivalent fractions, where we use the alpha beta ratio of 10 gray for tumor and three gray for late reactions for the OARs. And we ensure that the overall treatment time is kept as far as possible to 50 gray. Now, the dose volume parameters that are recommended are the reporting of D100, but that is not very sensitive. Um, that is not very reliable because it is very sensitive to uh, contouring, uh, spikes in contouring. So 
the more reliable parameter is D98 and D90. And this represents the minimum dose delivered to 190% and 19% of the volume of interest respectively. So once you're prescribing to D90, you know that this is the minimum dose. And like what I showed you before, if you're prescribing to point to the tumor actually receives much higher dose. Similarly, when you're prescribing to your HRCTV, your GTV actually is receiving a higher dose. And uh, we also assess the volume V100 where the volume receiving 100% should be more than 90%. And the most common parameter that we use is the 2CC reporting of the rectum and sigmoid, which should be less than 75 gray EQD2, and for bladder should be less than 90 gray EQD2. Now, uh, between point A and image guided brachytherapy, uh, what is the relationship, you know, because over the years, we are still struggling between point A and image guided because the image guided recommendations say that we should be using an MRI. However, uh, we still have not been able to completely move on to that concept. So um, do we still stick to point A? Now, if we, if we see the point A, it is basically a fairly good representation of an average position of the tumor. But what happens is that the smaller tumors, that is, receive a much higher dose and a larger tumor, larger tumors receive suboptimum dose. So about two thirds of your patients, that is about 70% cases, may still be covered with point A. And uh, larger tumors are the ones where need additional um, uh, basically uh, techniques to cover these doses or dose escalation, which is inadequately taken care of by point A and smaller tumors may not require such high doses, especially if the OAR doses are being very high. Now, if we see the impact on the OAR doses, uh, how are bladder uh, ICRU point doses and volumetric doses related? Now, there's a significant linear correlation between the ICRU rectal point and the 2cc rectal doses. And now, ICRU point doses are, is actually not a very good predictor in an individual patient. Rectal dose in general is seen to be 20% large. Uh, the ICRU rectal absorbed dose is generally uh, 20% larger than rectal 2cc doses and bladder doses are approximately 20% smaller as compared to the uh, bladder 2cc doses. So it's not a very good predictor of the doses to these, the bladder and rectum. But however, like I said before, the ICRU rectal point is also known as the rectal vaginal point. And it's a very good point that these days we are using for doses to the vagina, which is coming up as an organ of interest. So what is the relevance of point A in the era of image-guided adaptive brachytherapy? The, we cannot do with point A. So that is why I said it is very important to have your basic concepts right. It is still keeps a check on us. It allows comparison of different approaches. So you still, it uh, allows us to compare different approaches. Point A, like I said, is a surrogate of the irradiated volume. So it is not a prescription point. It basically acts as a surrogate of the volume that is being irradiated. It is the starting point for planning. We always start the planning for image-guided brachytherapy, starting from a point, which is a point A, because that's a reliable point, which has shown us controls uh, over decades. So we, we start with this point. And this, like I said, also helps us keep a check on major dose escalation and reduction. So there are various thresholds of point A, which we still follow while following doing image-guided brachytherapy. And what are the thresholds? So if we are using 2D X-ray based, the threshold is 75 gray. So we do not, uh, uh, you know, go lower than 75 gray for point doses. If you are using CT based brachytherapy for image guidance, do not let your point A dose, the EQD to go beyond 70 gray. And for MR, it is 65 gray. So Whereas we do optimize the doses to cover the HRCTV, we also have a check guardian in the form of point A, which tells us that we do not have to move too much away from these doses and these are the cutoffs. Now, um, what are the limitations of intracavitary application alone? We know we have image-guided adaptive brachytherapy. We are seeing the tumor, but not all tumors may be covered with intracavitary brachytherapy alone. Now, the classical intracavitary brachytherapy covers the medial part of the para, the entire cervix. And so tumors which have middle and lateral parametral extension, tumors which have distal vaginal extension beyond the upper third, those with unfavorable topography or with asymmetric tumors or with unfavorable topography of the OARs are the ones which may not be adequately encompassed by the standard intracavitary applicators. So what do we do? 
We now have newer techniques where we use combined intracavitary and interstitial brachytherapy, or you have option of using template-based brachytherapy where you can use in either freehand needle uh, placements or uh, templates like the Muppet and the Sayer Nablet. So this is just to show the limitations of point-based prescription and how much does point A cover when we prescribe the dose and what is the various um, dimensions that point A covers. So this is basically based on a ring applicator of 30 mm diameter. So if you are prescribing point dose to point A, that is uh, 20 uh, mm either side at point A, at the level of the ring, you are covering approximately 30 mm on either side. So a tumor about of about 4.5 or 5 centimeters at this junction may actually be covered with point A brachytherapy uh, alone or with, uh, sorry, with intracavity brachytherapy alone. Now, as you go higher up, and if you go two centimeters above the level of point A, this narrows down and this is about 18 mm. So that is the lateral coverage, okay? So you have to see your tumor dimensions. And that is why I said that about two thirds of the patients uh, even using uh, the image guided concept may still be covered with the standard intracavitary applicators. Now, if you have a tumor which is larger or an asymmetric tumor like this one, this will not be adequately covered with a um, point or a, with an intracavitary alone. So what do you do then? So these days we have modern applicators where we have incorporated interstitial needles within the intracavitary applicator. Now this, what you see is basically a, a Viana applicator, sorry. This is a Viana applicator and these are the various applicators that are used for combined intracavitary interstitial techniques. Now, if you have an involvement of the medial parametria, you could insert the needles simultaneously. Now, these are basically MR compatible needles. You get these proguide plastic catheters and these are these titanium needles. You insert these needles uh, to a depth of about three to four centimeters and we usually load about three centimeters of these needles. The loading of these needles has to be very careful because these are very high dose regions. So you load not more than 10% of dwell time of the uh, entire loading. So we, we take the loading of the tandem and we load about 10% and the maximum dwell time that we load is about 20%. We do not exceed that because that can cause very high doses in this region. And you never report the doses to the ipsilateral uh, point A where you have placed these needles. <coughs> so uh, the, this is the Stockholm-based ring applicator. The other applicator that is based on the Fletcher suit, which combines both the intracavity interstitial component is this Geneva applicator, which was initially known as the Utrecht applicator. Now here within the ovoids, you have provision for placement of these needles. And these needles of Viana and Geneva applicator are usually parallel to the central tandem. So they will cover only the medial part of the parametrium. Now, because, so what do we do about um, if there is a parametral extension more laterally? So if there is parametral more ext uh, uh, extension more laterally, this is the Viana 2 applicator, which was devised because you need uh, to cover the lateral pelvic bore or you need to go laterally. Now that is quite challenging. Even in the EMBRACE study, about 16% patients did have extension to the lateral pelvic wall, which is inadequately and which is not possible to be covered with these intracavity needles alone. So these are angled approximately 20 degree. So you can attach a ring and this applicator had an attached ring for placement of oblique needles. So you could do an application of parallel needles and oblique needles to basically take care of the uh, lateral parametrium. Now the modification of this applicator that we have now is the Venezia applicator, which is a versatile applicator wherein you can place both parallel and oblique needles. And you can also do uh, load the needles in case there is a vaginal extension. There is a cylindrical cap which allows the treatment of the vaginal wall. So these are the newer applicators that we are using with image guided brachytherapy, and that is where the there is technological advancements. So based on your tumor size or the HRCTV or the GTV at brachytherapy, you choose or pre-plan to use your applicators accordingly. Now this is to show you how the, the dose distribution occurs with parallel and oblique needles. Now, if you are doing an intracavitary application alone, the 
the needle loading in relation to the intracavitary 0% because of course the needles are not loaded and the distance from tandem to prescribed isodose at point A is 20 mm. Like I said, of course, because point A is, is defined at 20 mm and this can be anywhere between 15 to 25 mm. Now, if you load the needle, you, you cause um, sculpting of the isodose curve in the direction of the parametral involvement. And if you use parallel needles, um, the physical distance that is there between the tandem and these needles is approximately two centimeters. And the needle loading should be not more than 20%. We start with 10% because that can make this area very hot and prone to necrosis later. And what is the distance that you cover from the tandem laterally to the point at the level of point A, that is at two centimeters above is 25 to 35 mm. So if I tell you in a nutshell, it is basically one to 1.5 centimeters of parametral coverage is the advantage that you get when you are using parallel needles alone. Now, what you can add on to this is the oblique needles. And when we add on the oblique needles, the physical distance between the tandem and needle is about another three to seven mm extra, that is 23 to 27 mm. The needle loading is about five to 10% because you have uh, parallel and oblique needles both loaded. So the needle loading has to be lesser. And at the level of point, the coverage is about 35 to 40 mm. So in substantial number of cases, your lateral parametral coverage also is taken care of. And recent studies have shown that you could achieve doses of 85 to 90 gray, even with HRCT volumes where there is extension to lateral parametria by using these techniques with acceptable morbidity. Now, what has all this led to? Uh, basically, by using this concept, we are able to achieve 85 gray dose, that is D90 of 85 gray. These are results from the retro embrace. So we can now achieve controls of more than 90% across various sizes of tumors. Now, if I just have to show you, uh, for this, the vertical line uh, represents the tumor control and the horizontal line represents the HRCTV volume. For a tumor which has a small HRCTV volume, there is addition of 3% control when you move on from doses of 75 to 85 gray. There is a 7, 5% control for HRCTV volumes, which are moderate, that is about 30 to 40 cc. And if you move on two doses from, if you try and cover high HRCTV volumes with placements of needles and image guided adaptive bracket therapy, the, the, the uh, advantage that you uh, get in local control is to the tune of 13%. So that is phenomenal. So if you increase the dose from 75 to 85 gray, it is about 7%. And if you go up to about 95 gray, it increases to about 6% about more. And this is uh, not been reported by um, any of the trials before. And this is what has come up in even in Embrace that we are reporting excellent local controls now. Now, um, if there is a loss increase in overall treatment time, um, it's recommended that you increase a dose of 5 free to the CTV, HRCTV. And also for adenocarcinomas, also we do increase the dose to up to 90 to 95 gray against about 80 to 85 gray. Now, increase in HRCTV volume above 10 cc requires additional 5 gray for effluent local control. And this is what I've shown you here, that you do need to escalate the doses if the HRCTV volume is large. Now, coming to the role of interstitial brachytherapy, um, we still have, and when do we use it? So we use interstitial brachytherapy that is purely template-based brachytherapy when the parametral extent of the tumor cannot be taken care by intracavitary and interstitial, that is a combined ICIS technique, or if you do not have the provision for a combined ICIS technique. And also in cases where there is a narrow vagina or the patient has had a supra cervical hysterectomy, where you cannot place the tandem, you could use a template based intra uh, interstitial technique. And if there is inability to enter the OS. So the most common templates that we use are the Muppet and the Syed Neblet uh, templates for interstitial. But these days we do have a whole lot of templates that have been designed for use for interstitial bracket therapy with or without the use of the central obturator. Now, summing it up, uh, brachytherapy plays a sheet and a role in management of carcinoma cervix and is responsible for most cures. Now, this is the oldest form of conformal therapy and without heavy technological advancements. So, 
like I think we did answer this question last time also, there is absolutely no replacement or no comparison of any other external radiation technique for brachytherapy in cervical cancer. And why is this conformal? It is conformal because you deliver an inhomogeneous dose, which is desirable here, because you want a very high dose to fall off rapidly, uh, you know, so as to save the normal tissues. And this results in sparing of early and late responding normal tissues. The brachytherapy, which is given with high dose rate over a short um, time, counters the problem of tumor repopulation. Thank you. I would invite any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bhavna, for such an excellent lecture. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rashi, uh, she here, to kindly put up the questions. Dr. Yeah, Ashutosh, yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, one, uh, one question is of our last lecture. What is ideal packing? Okay. Ideal packing. See, ideal packing, basically, there is nothing like ideal packing as long as you can displace the rectum. For a bladder, we always pack alternately for bladder and rectum. You also have to be mindful of the dose that is there. If you have residual dose in the vagina, be very careful about the packing. You could actually be underdosing the tumor. Okay, so these are the points that you have to keep in mind for the packing. For the bladder doses, packing sometimes may not be very helpful because if you push too much posteriorly, uh, anteriorly for the bladder, if you do a very tight packing, what happens is that bladder is a flabby organ. The lateral recesses or the lateral horns fill up with the urine and the dose contribution comes up from the ovoids laterally. Okay, so the packing has to be moderate and for the rectum, the packing has to be adequate to displace the rectum enough so as the OAR's uh, doses are or the constraints are taken care of. So the packing has to is basically for two reasons. One is for OAR displacement and for applicator stability. Um, and it does not have to be very, very tight packing. Yeah, ma'am. Next question is, can you explain preloaded and afterloaded uh, applicator again? Okay, so preloaded applicators was in the era of the radium. Even initially for cesium, where we used to load the applicators before only with the sources. So that used to cause a lot of radiation hazard and that was a problem with the radiation protection. Over a period of time, what happened is we came with manual afterloading. We used to manually, we used to just insert the applicator in the theater and we used to manually afterload the sources. We used to have a trolley where we used to pick up these sources with a long forceps and then we used to insert. So these were placed typically within long tubes. So these had iridium sources and we would just place them. Then came the remote afterloading systems where we did not, this was again better than the manual afterloaders. So in the remote afterloading systems, everything was remote controlled. So this came even for MDR selectron brachytherapy and for HDR. So what we have today is the remote afterloading system. There is no exposure. We just place the applicator in the theater and we do the planning and we just do the computer. And after the, uh, uh, the command is given, then only the source moves on inside the applicator. Why only dose to 2 cc taken for OAR and Vicky therapy? Okay, so no, we do report the dose to 0.1 cc also. 2 cc is supposed to be the most reliable parameter. It's a conduquous volume and this is a very reliable parameter. And that is why we take 2 cc. And that is what clinical studies have shown. There is a maximum correlation of 2 cc doses with the toxicities. Yeah. Uh, next question is by Dr. Survi. Is, uh, is there any biological response difference between cobalt cysteine and iridium 192 sources or both uh, as both are having different energy? See, there have been dosimetric studies done so far where they are not showing too much of biological difference. And mm -hmm. the specific activity does vary, I agree. And we have both cobalt and iridium 192 and even we have done an analysis, the data for which is maturing. So there isn't, we are not finding any uh, difference between the sources as such. So my next question is, uh, uh, what does it actually mean by the term minimum dose to the maximally irradiated tissue of an OAR? Okay. So if you just go back to the diagram that I showed you, uh, within that 2cc volume, you are going to even have a 1cc volume. You are even going to have a 0.1cc volume. 
okay so that 2 cc volume is showing you only the minimum dose it is not showing you the maximum dose the maximum dose could be even to a point which is much smaller uh did you get it so that is basically the minimum dose like we prescribe so the maximum dose could be anywhere between that volume maybe to a 0.1 cc maybe to a point 0.5 cc, maybe to a 1 cc. So that is just representing the minimum dose that that area is receiving. So your 0.1 cc doses are the ones that we are correlating to fistulas and necrosis because that is the yeah. maximum dose that is being received to that small volume. Now here it is the minimum dose that is being received to a contiguous volume which is a more representative volume and which is a more reliable parameter for dose comparisons. Yeah, ma'am, Dr. Devanjan, who has asked the question, has written, he has understood. Okay. So, ma'am, next question is, uh, uh, when we use a large wide, which is recommended whenever possible, the 100% isodose curve lines within the wide. It should is not it desirable? 100% isodose lies within, no, why should it lie within the ovoid? Because you're going to be loading the ovoids also, no? Yeah, and we prescribe uh, at the surface or uh, 2 millimeters. Yes, millimeter yes. so surface. please uh, check the planning part. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, at the surface means it will be at the mucosal line that will be in uh, connection so with the IBS ovoid. recommendation that may represent your applicator may be displaced. So mucosa is not a very reliable uh, a point to See, so always go with the IBS recommendations. Even mm -hmm. using the IBS recommendations, there are various centers which are using various loading patterns. There also the point it differs. That is why now you have the ICRU 89. I didn't touch it because of the paucity of time, but basically ICRU 89 is also a replica or a simile of the ICRU 38 concept in context to image guided brachytherapy. So you are you 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 cannot always rely on the points. But always uh, for point A, for prescription or for starting, uh, not for prescription, for starting your planning, always uh, it is recommended that you follow the ABS recommendations, which is from the surface of the ovoids plus the radius. It is not surface of the mucosa. Occasionally, you may not have a good application. Sometimes what happens is you, you do a packing and the packing comes in between the ovoid and the mm. disease. That also happens. Mm. It slips there. Or because of unfavorable anatomy, the applicator tends to stay behind. It does not abut the cervix. Mm -hmm. And yeah, always remember, this point is an applicator-based point. It has nothing to do with the anatomy. Okay, ma'am. Next is in uh, I, intravaginal brachytherapy. How are uh, dose prescription on surface of applicator and dose at 5 mm from the surface applicator different? What should you prefer? We prefer a dose of 5 mm from the surface of the applicator. You could do both, although both are recommended. But uh, 5 mill yeah, five millimeters from the surfaces that we prefer. Uh, uh, it depends upon your choice. Yes. How do you practice? Yes. Yes. Any and next question? I think this question was asked in the last lecture also. Any cutoff for, for Paras involvement? Yeah, I think uh, I can show you a uh, slide uh, to make it conceptually clear, where I showed you that if you have medial one to one point five centimeter is what you can cover with in, uh, combined intracavity interstitial techniques. If you use oblique needles, it's another thirty five to forty mm that you can cover. Uh, laterally at the level of point A and in case there is heavy parametral infiltration or you do not have provision for these techniques then you go in for template based perennial uh, perennial template based interstitial brachytherapy if you want I can show you that again for clarity yeah ma'am in between meanwhile I'm taking another question also okay uh, so question is, uh, uh, if we are using central tantrum in mutant, do we have to follow 10% loading for needles as in uh, intracavity no. brachytherapy plus ISBTPR? No, we no. use, see, for intracavity brachytherapy, we are basically calling the concept of intracavity brachytherapy. Here we use the interstitial 
based, uh, you know, computer based dose planning. So that that 10% doesn't hold true here. Because see, if you see the intracaptive brachytherapy, there the loading is based on the Manchester system. The yeah, next question, Dr. Uh, sorry, I think Dr. Rashi, we didn't get his uh, central tank in Muppet. No, okay, no, no, no. We, you know, and Muppet, with Muppet, you do not have the provision of doing image, which you still, are, we are using stainless steel needles. So, uh, we do not have the concept. It's very difficult to delineate the target with the stainless steel needles. There is a lot of artifact also. Yeah. So we are still yeah, using computer-based systems. Ma'am, what we are doing, we do uh, our CT scan before doing the brachytherapy, actually, planning, mm -hmm. so that we can understand how... I understand. Uh, I completely understand. Even we do that, you know, occasionally we do an MR at brachytherapy. We do not do a diagnostic MR. We do an MR at brachytherapy. We fuse that or we see the dimensions. And that is a recommendation again, which is coming for CT guided brachytherapy. The recommendations I didn't deliberately touch because that have, could have been very, very confusing for the residents because the concept basically is the same. And um, so we also do that, but we are not prescribing to a volume there. In the template-based interstitial bracket therapy, we are not prescribing to a volume like we are doing that for HRCTV. We are just seeing the doses. The volume is huge yeah. there. Yeah. Ma'am, next question is, do you follow any bladder protocol for uh, bracket therapy? Yes, we do follow a bladder protocol. And basically, it has to be reproducible bladder filling. You could use any protocol. Some people prefer to have the bladder completely empty. Uh, what we do is we empty the bladder and put uh, 50 cc of saline and let it flow. And uh, the other protocol that we have recently started is that we use 20 cc in which we use 20 cc saline and 2 cc of contrast to dilute the contrast. And then put the contrast in the bulb. So you have a differential contrast in the bulb and the bladder. So you can delineate it very well. So that 20 cc with the residue and you put it for free flow. So that's a reproduci reproducible bladder filling. And that you need is because here we are planning something. And while we are delivering, we want that reproducibility to be there. Tata used to at one time prefer to, uh, you know, have an empty bladder protocol where you used to suck the bladder, uh, this thing with a two me syringe. So any protocol that you follow, as long as it is a reproducible protocol, it is okay. Because you should know what you are planning. It should be something similar to what you're delivering. Yeah. Do you do brachytherapy in bladder or rectum involvement? Yes, it is recommended that you can use brachytherapy if bladder and rectum involvement is there on uh, MRI. There are studies also which tell you how much involvement could be there. Dr. Sajal want to ask some question. Dr. Sajal, you can ask. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, uh, I'm not able to see her actually. Is it uh, uh, fine? Uh, okay, I'm, am I audible? Yeah, yes. you are audible. You can ask. Okay, okay. Okay, ma'am, uh, congratulations on an excellent presentation. Uh, my only question to you is actually, since we are in the era of doing image-based brachytherapy, so, uh, and we have moved uh, from point A towards volume-based treatments. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is it possible to achieve 85 grays to 90 grays in every case, especially when rectum and sigmoid are near? Because what's happening is, uh, if means patient is going to have uh, late toxicities because of that. So I, is it <laughs> Yes. I agree with you, Dr. Sajil, because uh, there are even um, Embrace does report toxicities to the tune of 10 to 15%. You know, okay. uh, that does happen when you, but then you have to remember that provided you are prescribing to the volume. I hope you are no, not doing point-based prescriptions completely and are you purely doing MR based Prachy? It's not purely ma'am, it's not purely, it is selective only. Because and we are also uh, somewhere in between. Yes, 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 it's, it's in, I am also in between. Uh, most, most of the cases I do with CT based treatments and uh, I also offer MR in those patients who are eligible and those who, who can actually pay for MR. Uh, and uh, definitely if uh, I have a chance, then I'll fuse MR with CT and uh, go for brachytherapy uh, uh, planning. And I uh, uh, huh. just want to say uh, that uh, it, it is actually difficult for a patient of uh, in, in, in an Indian setup to 
pay for MR at every brachytherapy. So means you know, MR done prior to brachytherapy will help that, us in uh, guiding see, the treatment. Uh, See, if I have to tell you, and for the residents, like I have been again and again saying, about two thirds of your patients may not require anything more than a simple intracavitary alone. And that is why I showed you the slide of that dimensions, that if you prescribe at point A, what is the tumor dimension that it can cover? Okay, so most of the patients will be covered in intracavitary brachytherapy. What we are doing here is that we are prescribing to point A and we are contouring on CT. We are not doing an MR for these patients. We are doing an MRI only on the patients who have an, uh, a parametrial disease at the time of brachytherapy, and that is only a non-contrast MR to see the dimensions. At the same time, we are not fusing the MR with the CT because that is taken in a different treatment position. So you just take the dimensions with the help of a clinical examination. You can, to an extent, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, have an idea about your GTV and your HRCTV. And then you can pre-plan and decide whether this patient requires advanced brachytherapy application in the form of combined intracavity interstitial or in the form of inter uh, interstitial alone. And this, this subset accounts for about 20% of our cases, 20 to 25, not more than that. So we are not moving on completely to MR as of now, because it is difficult. There, are, there is a learning curve to it. With CT, there are inherent problems of overestimations of the contours, especially the lateral dimensions. We still have to undergo a validation study of the CT-based recommendations that have been published. That is the combined Jack Eastro uh, Eroy uh, recommendations, uh, the IBS recommendations that are there. So we are all somewhere in between. So basic idea is that you have to optimize your treatment according to the response at brachytherapy. And you can also modify uh, your treatment in the subsequent fraction. So if you have used an intracavitary brachy on the first fraction and you feel that the patient is inadequately covered and you have not able, been able to deliver that dose, for the next application, you could give a combined intracavitary interstitial technique to achieve better OAR uh, uh, constraints and improve the dose to the tumor. Now, the advantage of using interstitial needles at times is also that you, uh, you know, kind of flatten the, uh, the isodose curve, you stretch it. So what happens is that the, there is dose reduction anteriorly and posteriorly to the bladder also. So that can also be done. So these days we are using, uh, we are tailoring our techniques and treatments according to the responses and the um, you know, uh, doses at first fraction. Uh, I think, ma'am, this is the last question. How to cover lower vagina by brachytherapy? So you cannot cover lower vagina brachytherapy. with intracavity brachytherapy. It's only the upper third. These days, what you can use is a venesia applicator if you have one, even we don't have one for that matter. So you use a simple template-based brachytherapy or you could even use a cylinder with a tandem uh, if the depth of infiltration is not too much. But then once you are using a cylinder, uh, because of the isodoses, they are they are all around uh, circumferentially, so you end up with higher bladder and rectum doses. So these are the techniques depending on the vaginal thickness that is involved. Uh, Dr. Rashi, we I can see two more questions here. Most cases we see sigmoid hugging the uterus, contributing to higher dose. How can we avoid this? Okay, so see, in that case, if you do have an MR at diagnosis and you know that there isn't a uterine involvement or involvement of the corpus, you could do away with loading the tip of the tandem because that is where the sigmoid doses come up from, you know. Most of the times, if you reduce the loading from the tip, from there only, you could end up reducing the sigmoid doses. They say sigmoid is mobile, but uh, many a times we do see that the sigmoid, sigmoid is stuck there at every application. So we do not in the first fraction, but in the subsequent fractions, we do these modifications of the tandem loading from the top, or we reduce the dwell time from the superior most source in the tandem. Uh, last question is volume-based brachytherapy. If OAR rectum doses more, how you go for optimization? A volume-based brachytherapy rectum, yes. So see one way that I told you is that you insert needles because what happens is you stretch the isodose instead of um, a banana shape or a spherical isodose that is all along because once you're doing image guided brachy you are sure or you have a fair idea about your target so you kind of 
stretch it laterally when you do the needles, when you insert the needle. So that is one way that you could reduce. The most common way or the most effective way is do a good packing. So the rectal doses can easily be removed by packing. Other thing is rectal preparation. Uh, if you have a lot of gas in the rectum, the patient has a lot of gas in the rectum and the rectum is loaded, the doses are going to be higher. So always prior to brachytherapy, ensure that there is a good preparation prior to the, um, uh, the procedure. So the rectum should ideally be empty and you should give a laxative or a nema prior to the brachytherapy application. Many a times uh, you could also insert a flatus tube in the rectum to do away with the gas. So these are the tips that you can follow to ensure that bladder dose, uh, the rectum doses are taken care of. One thing also we could we can do is that uh, if we are very sure that there isn't a disease, sometimes I reduce the ovoid loading. If that is where, because many a times the contribution of dose to the rectum uh, is substantial from the ovoid. So if you just reduce the uh, lowermost source, which is there towards the rectum, or you reduce the dwell time there, that could also help you in reducing the dose to the rectum. Dr. Rashi, I think there is no more question. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So I would like to invite Dr. Shalin sir for concluding remark. There is one more question that I noticed. Somebody has asked a question here, which is that is 85 to 90 gray a summation of EB? Sorry, sir, your voice is breaking. I couldn't get the question, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, I am repeating 85 to 90 gray is EBRT. Yes, yeah, sir. We can hear it. Kindly continue, sir. So, somebody has a question 85 to 90 gray dose that we are talking is EBRT plus LDR or EBRT plus HDR? Okay. That's to you. Okay. So I, I did show you that these days when we have to talk in terms of a common reference, we, we report the EQD to doses, that is the two gray equivalent doses, and that is calculated. It's a ratio of the alpha beta ratios of uh, the do, two gray equivalent and the dose fractionation that you're using. So you, you have these templates where you can calculate the dose and you use the alpha beta ratio of 10 for the tumor and for three gray for the OARs. So that is how you calculate. And this dose is basically a combination of external radiation and brachytherapy. So earlier, this dose used to be EBRT plus LDR. Right. But again, there are so many dose fractionations that we've been using. So now we, we uh, use the EQD2 concept. Earlier, we used to use dose rate corrections. We were using for LDR to MDR, it was roughly between 12.5 to 30% dose rate corrections across various centers mainly between 12.5 to 20 percent. Then for HDR, we moved on to roughly about 30 to 40 percent corrections. But then again, what the ABS recommendation said was that you have to go by your clinical uh, experience rather than the absolute dose fractionation schedules because it was difficult to fit them into radiobiological models. Now, what we do now is because you have the BDR and you have different fractionations that people are using, uh, even in HDR. So to equate the dose on a common uh, dose, this thing, you have to do it with the, you have to equate it with the two gray equivalent dose. And that is what even the ICRU-18. Right, addressed. so if I hand on that, audible Rashi. Yeah. Rashi, audible. Doctor, Dr. Silby, am audible? Uh, sir, no? your voice is very interrupted. I think there is another question that I see there. Yeah. Um, this says you, that you recommend yeah. to deliver all bracky dose in a single application with a gap of six hours in between two fractions. Okay, Dr. Yashwant Pawar. Uh, Dr. Yashwant, this has been done in a few centers. This was the COVID protocol which was being followed because uh, we were not sure if the patients would be COVID negative even during their next uh, application. And we did have a problem with logistics. So we did also follow this protocol. Uh, this has also been reported uh, and published by the Tata Memorial Hospital. We are still awaiting the long-term outcome. So what we did was that we gave a gap of six hours between two fractions. We did do that. Uh, and we did not go into seven to four. We mainly did it for nine into two. 
and uh, we will also be awaiting the long term toxicities uh, dr bhanda to what's about the uh, what's about the application any patient maintained application for 6 hours during that time we were we were it is very so difficult we did a replanning it no they will you know if you have immobilized them you've kept them on a trolley we used to keep them on a trolley there in itself you know outside there in the corridor we weren't allowing any movement we used to follow the bladder protocol rectum of course there could be some amount of gas filling there but uh, bladder protocol we were following and that was the time it was the crisis time and i think all of us have changed the dose vaccination schedules during covid times ma'am i yeah. think this will be an epidural Yes, we will await the results because if this happens, this solves a lot of problems for us. The overall treatment time, which is a major issue in most of the centers, uh, it does end up solving these problems. Yeah, one more question, Dr. Bhavna. Uh, yeah. What's about the universal patients for HBS positive or HIV? Do you uh, do brachytherapy in these patients? Or... Of course we do. We follow the universal precautions and we do brachytherapy. Okay, I have a question from Dr. Sajal. A uh, good question. That is 9 and 2 is inferior to 7 and 4 as per Embrace. Um, no, Embrace doesn't say 9 and 2 is inferior to 7 and 4. That is the IEA trial and there are a lot of flaws and there are a lot of uh, concerns about the IEA trial. Uh, you use any dose fractionation as long as your HRCTB doses are achieved. Uh, I think dose fractionation really doesn't matter. So we are using 9 gray in 2. Not for all patients, we are using 9 grain 2 for patients with smaller tumors, provided the HRCTV is covered, is getting 85 to 90 grains. Okay. Now, for patients who have larger HRCTV volumes, we reduce the dose per fraction and we and for dose escalation, we take the dose to 7 into 4. Because if I use 9 grain to 2 for a larger tumor, that would be inadequately covered. Okay. So then we use 7 into 4. We are ensuring that HRCTV coverage is there. But I agree with you that the recommendation is 7 into 4 these days. But uh, if you that is only if you're doing MR-based. If you end up doing 7 into 4 with CT-based, you are going to have a substantial toxicity. So thank you so much, Dr. Bhavna. All the questions have been answered. One more question. Do you do even in hospital? Yeah. Yes, we do. do. We do. We do. So, Dr. Salin, sir, can you hear me? I can hear you. I... Can you hear me? Like I said, that we do not uh, leave any opportunity to do brachytherapy. All right. So, am I audible at all? Yes or no? Yeah. You're audible, sir. Okay. So, coming back to that EQD2 question, it will be useful to suggest that... Uh, the two gray per fraction that we typically use in external beam radiotherapy is equivalent, uh, fractionated once a day, from where we get our 45 or 46 gray in whatever fractions, is equivalent to a classic low dose rate, 50 gray, 50 centigray per hour LDR, as we know. Yes. So the, the, the short answer is that yes, it is 90, 85 to 90 gray is the combination of external plus LDR. But of course, the technical answer is that you use EQD2 gray. And the point that people need to understand is that EQD2 gray, two gray fractions somehow have been equivalent to the classic Manchester dose rate and the Paris dose rates of, you know, hovering between 45 to 50, 55 centigrade per hour at the reference to those low dose already on this therapy, even the Manchester's, the Manchester had that dose at point A. If I'm mistaken, is that right, Dr. Bhavna? So your voice is breaking. So I leave it at that. The, I'll, I'll tell you about the internet. I have a horrible internet. Sorry, uh, I, I think I need to sign off. So intermittently I can understand, but uh, I did get the initial part of the explanation, which was exactly the way it is that basically we've equated the two gray fractions to the classic LDR based system, especially the Paris and the Manchester. And, uh, and that is the basis or the where 
this comes from. And these days we, because there are various dose fractionation schedules that we are using, we are reporting EQD2 uh, doses. Right, so um, I, I got it. I think it's difficult to hear. So I think that makes a case that the LDR, HDR equivalence must also be elaborated upon in a separate, uh, in a separate talk. And we'll have somebody do that for us unless you volunteer. So <laughs> we need to explain that as well. But no, 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 I'm not asking you to do that. Yes, that I is... could do that. Somebody else could do that. But we're looking for, we're looking for, we're looking to identify a lot of talent within a large pool of oncologists in the state. And then even out, outside, of course, there is. But I think Dr. Like Manoj Kupar uh, does it capacity. excellently. In fact, I could have incorporated, but the time was short. I mean, I was just wondering no. how to put in everything. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's, it's already too much information. A lot of things have to be digested. And mercifully, we'll have all the and literally hang on to each phrase of yours and understand its meaning by, by, by looking to the references. That's how I think the real learning will take place. I'm afraid I'm again lost. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Bhavna. It was really a very nice lecture and uh, mind-blowing discussion also. Uh, though one question has been uh, unanswered, so I would like to ask you, uh, is there any role of anticoagulant use for patient being capped for more than one fraction? So uh, you could use a compression bandage for patients who undergo seven gray into four or these days you even for interstitial um, brachytherapy, you could do that because that goes on for about three to four days. Uh, some people do use um, Clexin as a prophylactic measure. Uh, so you can use that. We do not use Clexin. We do use compression stockings. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhavna. Uh, thank you once again on behalf of UPRI. Thank you so much, Dr. Shalin, sir, Dr. Rashi Panas, Marjeshan. And thank you once again, Dr. Bhavna and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.